Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all protocols uh, observed. I've been asked to uh, share some um, introductory remarks to this uh, very important um, event, and I'll be with you here and uh, with, the, with the team, and indeed, of course, is here from now until the very end of uh, the sessions, because um, at least on the GFAN's uh, side and the work that we're trying to do advising the Secretary General of the UN, and with other hats that I'm happy to uh, carry and uh, to be affiliated with their organizations. As the providers of these hats, there is a great deal of learning and getting guidance from the discussions and the interventions um, in, in, the, in the four parts of uh, this session. And I'm very pleased that we had such excellent organization on the substance, on the speakers, and I look forward uh, for what we uh, should really be uh, taken with us for the implementation of better standards to guide our work on finance for climate. And um, three things I'd like to share with you. Um, FTI, DFI, and AP. Um, our business comes with uh, very confusing uh, acronyms, but before I get into that, uh, to these acronyms and what they stand for and their relevance to what we are discussing, let me just emphasize what I've been saying in different contexts from the very beginning of this day, including engagement with our colleagues and friends um, in Bonn, uh, working in different working groups in the preparation of COP29, uh, searching for a new lucky figure for uh, finance for climate, the new 100 billion that should be multiplied by at least 10. But who cares if, the, if it is going to be 10 uh, times what we have of what we have today of 100 billion to have 1 trillion and without adequate methodology, without adequate standards, without good reporting, I would say that emphasizing importance of methodology, transparency and governance on the new figure for climate finance is more important than just promising a 100 billion that's still subject to dispute. If you read the different reports coming from the contributor side, it's 100% delivered last year. If you are checking some of the independent think tanks or Oxfam, it's no more than 20 to 25%. So this is a great deal of learning that we should really be um, uh, guided by, and there is no better than standards that we agree on to guide us on that matter as well. Um, but there are other things that we have been engaged on, uh, on in mitigation, and just uh, less than two hours um, ago, we were discussing nature and biodiversity, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the, the same themes are reoccurring. But one, one good thing here that um, I'm, I'm very positive about, because the rest of what I'm going to say before I get into the acronyms, I'm not very positive. Africa is, is providing the promise of sustainability, not just for the continent, but beyond. Demographics are on our side. The natural resources, not just the CRM or the uh, critical raw material, uh, we have been blessed by nature to have them. Actually, two of my good uh, professors from Warwick University, Alan Rowe and, uh, um, and uh, uh, his uh, uh, colleague um, um, on the work, uh, Tony Addison, just finalized the second uh, Oxford University Press book on the future of extractives in the continent, and I encourage you to have a look on the previous book, 600 pages on extractives. The second one is basically about governance and better partnerships uh, for um, uh, the uh, extractive industries, including CRM. Uh, but demographics are there, they, uh, were uh, blessed by nature, and of course, we have a great deal of the opportunities. Risk-adjusted returns are on our side. Even if we include what we discussed earlier today, on the perception, even if you are adjusting the returns to actual or even perceived risks, those who are involved in Africa are getting decent returns of their investments, and we have the authority um, on this um, uh, matter that is going to be talking to us about it and the experience of the uh, AFC on that matter. So uh, if this is the case, what is really stopping us, and apologies to Simon and colleagues because I didn't see more hurdles to our development than the one that I just shared um, uh, two hours ago, it's debt, obstacles to trade, and the spillovers of the new industrial policies. 
and uh, the world is without adequate debt restructuring, debt resolution mechanism. And it seems nobody cares because the exposure is different from the old days and there is a great deal of unfairness, including the origination of debt and the role of the credit rating agencies and the fact that there have been a great deal of implications to over indebtedness to the extent that our countries, not just in Africa, but beyond developing economies and emerging markets are with net capital flows to be negative. Uh, last year and it was close to zero 2022 and it seems to be in the negative in the next two years. That needs to be dealt with. Trade is suffering from a great deal of obstacles and we need to put that in the overall context. And then the other thing is basically about the spinovers of the new industrial policies from the IRA to the new greening of the industries in Europe, in Korea, in Japan, while they are great for the individual countries, but we should be mindful to the spillovers. Now, some confusing um, um, new measures, including CBAM, and um, I've been asked by the EU to be a peer reviewer of a good study that they did uh, on the matter, but I can tell you in the short term, mid term, unless there is some concessional finance, technical support, this is going to be detrimental um, and compromising many of our industries with their supply chain in the short term, mid term. And I hope that there will be our good partners in the EU will be listening and adjusting the implementation based on this, because nobody wants to see more bankrupt industries or, um, uh, or workers in the street unemployed because of that. So, and the, the acronyms then, and I'll uh, stop up there, there. Uh, the acronyms, uh, FTI, DFI, and AP. FTI is coming from one whom I quoted as well in the morning, one of the most beautiful minds that we had today, the uh, formidable uh, Esther uh, Duflu. Um, um, and I think uh, uh, Minister Rani al Mashat was with us when she addressed us in the preparation of COP27. And she said, well, if you are keen about change, you need to have three things with you. FTI, this is my acronym, not hers. F is finance, T is technology, and the third of great relevance to our work and indeed his work with her team is the incentive one. Incentives need to be guided by the standards, finance need to be guided by the standards and will not go and embrace new technology without the standards. So we need to get the FTI together and this is basically an authority, not just because she is a Nobel Prize laureate but she did the experiments and evidence to support what she is saying and this common sense. The good thing about top, top uh, Nobel Prize winners, they can simplify what we know, but with evidence. And uh, um, um, Simon and I work closely with one of the, the other beautiful minds, um, uh, Mike Spence, and we'll, I learned, and I bet uh, Simon is kind enough to say that we learned as well something from him on the other um, acronym that I'm going to share, DFI. And this is related to implementing the SDGs because there is no confusion whatsoever in our efforts in implementing climate action with what we should really be doing in growth for sustainable development. Better data, better finance, and effective implementation. You, you, you could be biased to one of the two camps, and they are not two camps. They are um, either the Mike Spence camp, tell you do growth right by better data, better finance, and effective implementation, with my good friend uh, Mohammed Al Arian and uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Brown, they have uh, a book on perma crisis, and you can really see in their book many references to the DFI. So FTI, DFI, and uh, on that all, we are, should be guided by standards and one of the great confusion and high costs uh, in the market today that we are not really with the standards that we are happy to see. I was happy, as I was mentioning to Ndidi yesterday, that in a closed meeting, on my other hat as IMF, Emmanuel Faber updated us on many things that he did. And at the beginning, at the end of his intervention, well, it was about his successful visit to Africa, including to Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, and the promising outcomes that could come from some leading um, um, uh, uh, standards adopted by African nations. So what's the NAP about? Uh, well, just a recommendation after using and abusing many acronyms, I'm telling you, please NAP, not, na not to sleep, but NAP is no acronyms, please. So this is the NAP. After, after I use all of these acronyms, I would be more than happy, and I'm not shy to ask, what do you mean if you are using 
an acronym that I don't really understand. And actually, this NAP I created when I was at the World Bank in uh, 2011, working with Bob Zolik. And he asked us, I need a note, please, urgently. And I was working with him. Uh, for DRM, we have two teams working in two different DRMs. Um, one in disaster risk management, and the other one was about domestic resource mobilization. So that every, every team said, well, let's work hard. This is the, the boss, and we need him to uh, look uh, good in the meeting. But we we're guessing until he came back to us explaining. So of course, the, given that he was in Japan, Japan is very keen to do more work in, in, in the DRM, meaning disaster risk management. So they saved a teamwork. This is like 10, 15 people at different levels of the organization going to be doing something that nobody would be reading. So please save the acronym, save the money. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. And sorry that this was not exactly five minutes, but this is five minutes with some village modification. Thank you. Sorry to lose a few seconds. Um, what a great opening. Thank you. And I'm going to pick up on all those acronyms, but I also want to keep a promise. And I'm going to invite, who was already referred to Dr. Rania, up to the stage. I think you can come and sit on this podium. No need to introduce you. Do you want to come straight to the podium or sit for a moment? Entirely up to you. Well, it's, uh, it's very difficult to speak after Dr. Mahmoud with the different hats and, and uh, uh, you know, making each and every acronym uh, relevant with a story that all of us are going to remember. So that's also uh, uh, one of a very high standard to keep if we're talking about standards. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, uh, you know, if, we're, if we're trying to push uh, the climate agenda, we're hearing uh, common narrative everywhere. We're hearing that uh, finance is needed, uh, there's a gap between supply and demand, but we need bankable projects to be able to finance these projects. And then we hear blended finance to bring in the private sector, and then we hear, but the private sector needs to have the standards to be able to access the finance and you know, put all these uh, uh, ticks to say that they have been actually able to deliver uh, on what all of us want to see as common denominators when it comes to uh, uh, the global climate, uh, I don't want to say responsibility, but at least the targets that all of us want to see. So here comes the importance of uh, what Nadidi and your team are doing, the ISSB. And I recall that when we were in Cairo, uh, this was 60 days before COP27, we hosted uh, Egypt's uh, International Cooperation Forum, uh, and it was also the meeting of the African Ministers of Finance. And uh, what we wanted to come out with uh, during this uh, uh, forum uh, was uh, a call for uh, uh, how to implement. Because uh, uh, COP27 in Egypt was from pledges to implementation. We wanted to see that whether it's the 100 billion that has a huge debate. I think there, you know, what you presented, Dr. Mahmoud, was either a zero or a hundred. Uh, uh, and again, it's absolutely correct. It depends on who's doing the evaluation uh, and what are the standards or the evidence uh, for that evaluation. So during the ICF, uh, uh, with your team, we uh, pushed to have in the communique from the African uh, ministers and the communique at the end of the International Cooperation Forum uh, a clause, which I think uh, was very, very important because it uh, really uh, uh, paved the way to where we are today when it comes to uh, what we are seeing in uh, Kenya, South Africa, uh, and, and Nigeria. And I just want to read out uh, that, that part of the communique and I invite everyone to take a look at it because it also this communique was very important in many of the work that uh, uh, was implemented at COP27 and then the follow-up uh, with uh, uh, many of the items, particularly on the debt swaps, debt for nature. There's, it's, it was very rich uh, with uh, many pointers that reflected the initial condition, but also the action plan going forward. So it said support the work of the ISSB to introduce a global baseline of sustainability disclosures to meet the needs of capital markets, which will enhance transparency, accountability, efficiency, and comparability across markets, early adoption by African jurisdictions and companies has the potential to attract more investment and to boost private sector development in Africa. We urge the ISSB to work closely with African stakeholders and to provide strong advisory and capacity building support to achieve early adoption of ISSB standards in Africa. I think this paragraph really summarizes uh, in so many ways, uh, everything that uh, you have been calling for. But at the end of the day, it's a multi-stakeholder engagement 
uh, that uh, will push uh, this type of work forward. You need the policymaker uh, or the government that will uh, figure out, I and mean, we're having this discu discussion, where do you put the body that will be able to work with you in order to implement these uh, standards? Is it going to be uh, uh, with the environment, with the uh, uh, financial regulatory authority, with the central bank? There are so many elements uh, of these standards, so that's that's one of the uh, the questions. But definitely what it addresses is the transparency, transparency within uh, uh, the actions related to climate. It also is very important for accountability. So if a firm or a company uh, is uh, uh, getting the finance, which we all require, which is the concessional to be able to push, how are we going to hold it accountable for uh, uh, you know, implementing uh, and actually meeting what it uh, uh, you know, at the beginning uh, went out to do? And then the efficiency. So all of us want to cut costs. Even today when we're talking about uh, what we're seeing with respect to floods or even the uh, energy crisis, each and every part of the resource that might be wasted due to inefficiency, it becomes so important to make sure that we are cutting these uh, types of costs. And then most importantly, as we are trying to attract FDI, not the FTI, uh, it's the comparability across markets. So it's really in markets where there are going to be standards which are clear and standards where you can compare. That is going to be how uh, countries, uh, I don't want to say compete, but definitely that's the world we live in, will be able to be uh, more attractive and incentivize uh, uh, more uh, private sector uh, uh, to, to, to come in. The other uh, very important aspect uh, in all of this uh, is, of course, the advisory and the capacity building support. And when we talk about South-South uh, cooperation, when we talk about triangular cooperation, uh, it is uh, elements of a puzzle which each and every uh, constituency, each and every stakeholder wants to know more about. So I think uh, there is, uh, in the space uh, of climate action, and I say this uh, from, uh, uh, you know, I'm a macroeconomist, uh, uh, was at the IMF for many years, then Minister of Tourism, Minister of International Cooperation. When people talked about climate action, it was seen as, you know, something that ministries of environment were looking at. And I really think that the breakthrough for all of us was COP26, the one year before COP27, when uh, I believe the, it became not just the activists that are calling for climate action, but really all hands on deck private sector and the role of private sector was pronounced, but pronounced with uh, very important uh, 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 solutions. So we had uh, at that time the UN uh, Secretary General with the envoy, uh, the GFANS, uh, private sector trying to come together. So I think there was a really an important structural shift in the way all of us think about climate action at COP26 and then COP27, COP28, and what's going to happen at COP29 is a trend, you know, we, we had a, a structural change and we're moving forward where each and every stakeholder has uh, uh, so much to do. I want to conclude by uh, uh, one element uh, which I cannot be in any uh, discussion on standards or climate action without mentioning what Egypt has done to try and put together the different stakeholders to push forward country platform. Also, what you are doing here has to be country-led. There has to be country ownership. There has to be uh, a belief that uh, this is in order for countries to move and actually achieve their NDCs. It's not just through government projects, but also projects which are PPPs or private sector or in order to uh, get uh, blended uh, uh, finance. All of this requires uh, that uh, country leadership comes into uh, effect. And here we uh, put together our own country platform, the Nexus of Water, Food and Energy, certain uh, uh, projects, uh, try to mobilize financing for these projects, including a debt swap, including uh, private sector engagement. So again, uh, if I'm looking at uh, uh, the standards here, it would be definitely uh, a way to attract more of the private investments into the country platforms. So I can go on for a long time, but I think uh, if I just take from the statement that was put, or that paragraph that was put in the ICF communique, I would again say transparency, accountability, efficiency, comparability. Uh, let's see if there's an acronym out of here. T-A-E-C, Tyke. So let's say so transparency, accountability, efficiency, and comparability. I think these are extremely, extremely important uh, objectives of the work you're doing. We need to also advertise what South Africa, Nigeria, 
and Kenya have done, how did it work, which stakeholders came together to make it possible. I think there, th this uh, knowledge sharing and South-South cooperation in these issues are uh, extremely important. I wish you uh, tremendous luck because you're on a fast track. If I look at what has been achieved from the first meeting uh, in Cairo to today, I think there's uh, definitely an acceleration and uh, this is what, as I mentioned, all of us have been feeling when it comes to climate action. It's no longer uh, divorced from development, it's no longer divorced from job creation, it's no longer divorced from uh, creating jobs that are affecting uh, people. People are at the core of climate action and this is something that uh, policymakers adopt, private sector adopts, and that's why the standards and ev evidence base is it's more important than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rania. If I may just ask you to stay on the stage just for a few minutes. Dr. Rania always runs, so I have to literally the microphone and make sure I catch her just for a moment. Um, I don't know whether Kevin Karaoke is already in the room. Cannot, yes, Kevin, please. Um, I just wanted to say something, and that was, you know, the ISSB was created in COP26, which Dr. Rania just spoke about, being a, a turning point. Um, it was also the point when GFANS pulled together, essentially, you essentially saw 137 trillion dollars moving towards climate-related investments. And this is when the ISSB was born, in 2026. And in 2027, let me just make this personal, I was fresh in this role, COP27. Did I say 2027? Okay, no. At COP27, just so September 2020. We're in 2024 now, so 2022. I was two months into a job. And if you can imagine the way President Adishino is right now, try and grab him and tell him that he should please insert something in the communique for you. Do you think that that will work? Not at all. And Dr. Mahmoud and Dr. Rania, not only did they listen to me, Dr. Rania was anchoring this ICF, and Dr. Mahmoud was planning for COP27, and they looked at me and they were like, what are you talking about? And they sat down and they listened, and they made the necessary connection. So the reason why we have that paragraph, that very prophetic paragraph that has become reality, is because of the commitment that they made then. And in addition to that, just to also applaud Egypt, Dr. Farid, who does a lot of work on IOSCO, on the global and emerging markets, has also made sure that Africa and the Global South continues to play a critical role in terms of making sure the standards, and I'm not going to use an acronym, are proportionate, which means that they apply not just to larger entities, but also smaller entities, are connected, so connectivity, that is sustainability-related disclosures, climate-related disclosures that are linked to financial statements and are interoperable. So you have one set of standards that are comparable. Um, and so what I'd like to do before I let you go, Dr. Rania, and before I invite you, I know, before I invite you to speak, also on behalf of the president, I would like to take a photo of also our three panelists who will come up on the stage later. Um, Simon, Sumaila, and I don't know whether Ugas is in the room as well. Brilliant. So we actually capture everybody who's here today, because then I can free Dr. Rania. I understand and I've been promised that the president will still come. Um, and at that point, we will then take another photo. But in the interim, Kevin, you're going to be him. Exactly. You're going to be him. So you're by all intents and purposes, you are he.
Thank you. Uh, Honorable Minister, my sister Rania, uh, Dr. Mugdin, uh, I don't know whether I call you my sister or the other thing. Anyway, <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to be here, uh, standing on behalf of uh, President Dehina. The governor's dialogue is still proceeding, so he can't be able to be here. But as uh, Dindi said, he is probably going to pass by. So let me uh, make his uh, remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, despite a very tight schedule, and indeed it is a very tight schedule this evening, I'm grateful that we have squeezed time to deliberate on the financial regulations that can unblock sustainable finance flows to Africa. I have spoken severally of the African opportunity, both in natural and labor assets. But I regret to note that at the midpoint of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, and as Africa Agenda 2063 enters its second 10-year uh, implementation plan uh, this year, with the exception of North Africa, that the percentage of people living in extreme poverty on the continent is projected to, to rise until 2030. The UN Secretary General has called for 500 billion to be made dollars to be made available to accelerate the progress of SDGs. It, was, it is also reported that Africa needs 194 billion annually to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, while an estimated 277 billion per year is required to meet Africa's climate goals. But fancy this, meanwhile, Africa accounts for only $30 billion or 2.5% of global climate finance uh, in 2020-2021. Clearly, the existing financial gap cannot be met with the current glo uh, global financial architecture. This is why we have strongly advocated for, for number one, the scale up of financing for global development to provide opportunities to leverage the significant assets managed by the private sector. Secondly, we need to simplify the global climate finance architecture, improve its coordination, and strengthen capacity for improved access to the funds. And number three, we need to increase the capitalization of MDBs, especially through large increases in paid in capital to have the capacity to leverage more financing and, co and, and call on developed countries to channel a portion of their IMF special drawing rights to MDBs, and I'm happy to see uh, uh, what I call the evangelist number one for SDR uh, just walking, very timely. Uh, and we appreciate those who have already done so. Secondly, uh, the private investment will be essential because we expect that 75% of the $2.8 trillion investment required by 2030 is expected to come from the private sector and to complement the public sector financing. Unfortunately, private, private investment currently accounts for only 14% uh, of climate finance in Africa, compared to about 40% uh, in, in East Asia, Pacific, uh, and Pacific, and 50% in Latin America and Caribbean. The adoption of transparent and credible sustainable standards and taxonomies will enhance investor confidence and eliminate uh, potential for, for greenwashing. We look forward to working with international sustainable st uh, st uh, st sustainability standards. Uh, standards, global standards uh, should not. Uh, sorry, global standards should not be reason for closing the door on Africa's innovations, but rather an enabler for green transformation. This was, the, this was the rationale behind the creation of IFAC, a platform for honest exchange on requisite policy and regulatory frameworks for Africa's financial sector to leverage on international uh, climate finance at scale. The Africa Development Bank has been at the forefront of several flagship programs to drive global goal on net zero carbon emissions by 2050, while ensuring that no one is left behind on the SDG agenda. Some of these uh, efforts include, number one, the issuance of 
750 million sustainable hybrid bond in January of this year, representing a first ever hybrid capital transaction from an MDB. The initiative was oversubscribed at $6 billion. Secondly, we have the climate action window, a first of its kind, and, uh, and this, this window is dedicated uh, for financing climate action for the benefit of 37 uh, low-income countries. The climate action window currently has $49 million and aims to raise up to $13 billion to fund adaptation, uh, mitigation, and technical assistance in the proportion of 75, uh, 20, uh, 15, and 10, respectively. We also have the $20 billion Desert to Power Initiative that, takes, that seeks to generate 10,000 megawatts of solar power to provide electricity uh, supply to 250 million people in the Sahel region. We also had, and I think for most of you who have been around today, you've heard a lot about the Alliance for Green Infrastructure in Africa, which is an initiative uh, of, the, of the African Development Bank, Africa 50, and the African Union Commission, and several other partners that seeks to mobilize $10 billion of green investments through the private sector. We have, uh, or we are also looking at clean cooking solutions, and here that we aim to provide access to clean cooking solutions to one billion Africans uh, who are without, uh, and that was at, and, and at COP28, we, ploy, we pledge to mobilize $2 billion over the next 10 years for clean cooking solutions in Africa. This in turn will galvanize the global community, this has in turn galvanized the global community, community to commit another $2.2 billion for clean cooking at the Africa Climate uh, a Clean Cooking uh, Summit that was held two weeks ago. We also have the Technologies for Africa, Africa's Agricultural Transformation, or, or simply TAT, which seeks to double the agricultural productivity by making proven technologies available to more than 40 million agricultural producers by 2025. To date, TAT has deployed climate resilient agricultural technologies and fertilizers to 13 million African farmers in 40 uh, countries to help boost the continent's uh, food production and food security. We also have what we call the African Green Banks Initiative, which is under AFAC and seeks to, uh, to create specialized national green investment facilities to scale up financing for climate projects. In 2023, the Green Banks Initiative supported Rwanda Green uh, Investment Facility, or IREME as they call it, to access $42.8 million from the Green Climate Fund. Similar technical assistance consultations are underway with the banks in Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, and Morocco. These initiatives and many more will require financing at scale to ensure Africa's low carbon and climate resilient future. The right financial sustainability, regulatory frameworks are enablers for capital flows to, to create the Africa that we want, certainly before 2063. Most of us will not be around then. Let's get to work. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Kevin. Dr. Rania, as I promised, we're going to take another photo because we've now been joined by the SDR evangelist. So my panelists, please prep, come back up again. Um, but if I can just say that about a year ago, if I get my dates right, Kevin officiated over a marriage on a stage, actually, at Africa Climate Week, which was the preliminary prenuptial marriage where I actually got down on my knees like this with his, well, with their counterpart, Solomon, um, and then subsequently, my chair, Emmanuel, who you'll hear on video in a second, went off to New York Climate Week, where he met with President Adishino, who is sitting here, actually, as well as Kevin. Um, and they made a joke about this marriage. You know, they had a good hearty laugh about it. But today, we're actually consummating the marriage on paper, at last, with a signature. So actually, the most important thing, and this is really powerful because we've started off today with Egypt. Um, and I remember the first time I met with you, Dr. Mahmoud, what you said was, we need to build strong ties between Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East. And with the signing of the African, um, sorry, Arab Capital Markets Federation, MOU with ASEA, um, that's actually also led by an Egyptian, we have that bridge with the capital markets. And the ISSB is committed 
to make that work with Rami. So Egypt continues to lead in a million and one ways. We're just waiting for you to adopt the standards and lead also so we can name that also and we're on that journey. So we've started off today with Egypt. We've now continued with Kenya, which is where the theoretical marriage happened and it's now going to be signed today. And then we now, well, now we're gonna do another photo while Dr. Rania is still here. Bring the, bring the panelists up and um, we carry on. We have more gender, as you, as you notice, more and more women. Yes, no, no, stay, up, photo. So, now I know we have two videos. So we have G-Fans, Mary Shapiro, and we also have Emmanuel Faber, who have actually made a recording for us. So that's going to show on the screen briefly now in support of this AFDB, ISSB partnership. And then I think the most important thing afterwards, which we're going to ask the panelists to speak to, um, Hasatu, Kevin, if I can drag you to stay, I will. Um, Dr. Mahmoud as well, and Dr. Rania as long as she can. Um, Samila and Simon and Ugas will also join us. The big question is, where do we go beyond disclosures? And how do we actually make sure that this is not just a talk shop? So if we kneel on stage one year ago and talk about a marriage, and one year later we sign it, Likewise, also, let it be, and I've spoken to President Adishino and the Secretary General, so that next year, when we create a similar panel on this stage, led by our precious VPs, especially our evangelist, Kevin, we had a conversation outside there, based on real projects, we will actually come here and report on action, and investments, and capital flows, and outcomes. That's our intention. I'm busy blabbing here because I'm hoping that the video will show up. And if it doesn't, then I think we will actually jump into that panel immediately. But if the video is ready, then I would ask for Mary um, to speak and Emmanuel to speak. Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Sabert, and I am the chair of National Sustainability Startups Board, acronym ISSB. I'm delighted to be speaking to you at the African Development Back Annual Meetings. While I cannot be with you there in Nairobi, the ISSB is excellently represented by my fellow board member, Dr. MDD Nori Ndozio. Today is an important day as we strengthen our partnership with AFDB by signing a letter of intent between the two institutions, providing our commitment to work together to support African jurisdictions in their adoption of ISSB standards. Capital markets are the heart of supporting Africa's transition towards more sustainable development, building resilient, stable financial systems, and allowing us to unlock capital flows. The ICSB's two standards, IFRS S1, general requirements, and IFRS S2, climate, will help to strengthen African capital markets as well as increase transparency within value chains by establishing a global baseline of sustainability-related disclosures. Our standards have been designed to be able to be applied to all resource settings with proportionality mechanisms built in to ensure application is appropriate to a company's circumstances. Since our standards were released last June, we see Africa leading the way in driving both mandatory and voluntary adoption of our standards. A number of African jurisdictions have signaled their interest in adopting ISSB standards already, and we continue to engage with the relevant regulatory bodies and exchanges, and have built a strong relationship with AFDB President Adesina, who I met with last September. In March, I had the opportunity to engage with government officials and stakeholders on a visit to Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. 
In Kenya, I met with President Ruto and participated in an event with the Kenyan Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the Capital Market Authority, and the Nairobi Stock Exchange. ICPAC has stated its intent to adopt the ISSB standards. In Nigeria, I met with President Tinubu, who reaffirmed Nigeria's commitment to implement the ISSB standards. We also held discussions with Vice President Shetima and six ministers, including the Honorable Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Well Edul, who chairs the African Caucus, convening African finance ministers and central bank governors. While there, Nigeria launched their adoption roadmap at the Nigerian Stock Exchange with us. And finally, in South Africa, I met with Deputy Finance Minister David Masondo, representative from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the Institute of Directors of South Africa, and the Integrated Reporting Committee, focusing on the value of ISSB standards for supporting resilient economies and as a tool to support South African decarbonization and just transition-related objectives. In all three countries, we also met companies, preparers, that are on their way to voluntarily adopt and early adopt our standards, as well as investors uh, in their need for the kind of language that we're developing. Our engagement in Africa has continued this month, where we convened with partners the inaugural ISSB Pan-African Regulatory Roundtable in Mauritius, where representatives from 22 countries met to discuss ISSB standards. And I really want to thank AFDB and AIC for their support for this program. So our partnership with AFDB and through membership of the African Financial Alliance on Climate Change represents a strong commitment to support adoption of ISSB standards and capital flows across Africa. We are really excited to continue our work together through advanced capacity building support technical assistance, and the development of training materials supporting African jurisdictions in their adoption journeys. So I wish you all a productive side event at annual meetings. Thank you for your trust and confidence in our work. I don't know, we're gonna take Mary right away, but if I can just, again, actually, I can, start, I can invite one more person onto the stage, and I'll start with, I'm torn between Somaila and Ogas. Let's go and play the video, and I'll explain it afterwards. I'm sorry I cannot be with you today in person, but I am delighted that our GFANS Africa Chair, Dr. Mahmoud Mohildan, is there with you. His knowledge and passion are unparalleled, and we're lucky to have his energy dedicated to this vital topic. It is a pleasure and an honor to speak to such esteemed guests and colleagues, and I would like to commend the AFGB and the ISSB for their important work. In particular, I would like to commend President Adesina and Ndidi for their collaboration and congratulate them on signing what I hope will be an important MOU. As well as serving as Vice Chair of GFANS, the world's largest climate finance organization, I was also the head of the Secretariat for the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. The TCFD has formed the basis for the ISSB's disclosure standards, so it gives me great pleasure to see the collaboration today between the AFDB, ISSB, and GFANS Africa, and the progress being made on this vital topic. Before turning to today's topic, let me start with an honest assessment of where we are. If unabated, climate change will exacerbate the other risks facing the world, weakening growth and increasing debt, burdening our health systems, decimating nature, making heavily populated areas of the world uninhabitable, and fomenting geopolitical tensions. Tragically, the impacts of climate change are likely to be most severe in regions like Africa, which have done the least to cause it. There is both an economic and moral imperative for all of us to act. That said, climate may also be our greatest opportunity. Transitioning to net zero by 2050 has the potential to create 200 million jobs. Clean energy's multiplier effect could also increase GDP by 4% at the end of this decade. Africa is well positioned to seize those benefits 
with a young labor force, low emissions, and relatively abundant sun and land. President Ruto and the Kenyan government acknowledged this by hosting the Africa Climate Summit last year, where GFANS Africa signed its own MOU with the AFGB. To reap these benefits, the pace of annual clean energy investment still needs to rise nearly threefold to keep the world on track. Fortunately, there are bright spots. The global pace of investment in renewable energy is rising exponentially, with 50% more capacity added in 2023 than in 2022. And the pace of additions is set to continue to grow in the next five years. Countries like Kenya are already close to having clean grids, and countries like Namibia are scaling solar and wind faster than the average pace needed globally in one and a half degree scenarios. It is clear that private sector finance is required to close this funding gap and deliver the trillions of dollars that will be needed to transition globally, including in emerging markets and developing economies. At this critical juncture, we must keep the momentum. While a lack of private sector climate data continues to impede global efforts to invest, efforts are underway, building off the work we have done over the past decade to support decision-ready climate data. The work of the ISSB and the AFDB to support countries in Africa in implementing the ISSB recommendations will be crucial in this regard. With the ISSB standards now endorsed by IOSCO and being adopted across many jurisdictions, they will cover tens of thousands of companies by the end of next year. I commend the many African countries that have begun the process of implementing the ISSB recommendations, including Kenya and Nigeria. Earlier this month, the ISSB, the AFDB, and GFANS Africa ran a workshop in Mauritius supporting those countries committed to implementing climate disclosures. This is important work and we will continue to join with our partners in the ISSB and AFDB to support financial institutions, corporates and regulators in their efforts to implement climate disclosures and transition planning. To that end, at COP28, Mike Bloomberg and I launched the Global Capacity Building Coalition alongside leaders from the AFDB, ISSB, the UN, and other leading organizations. This coalition will seek to improve the quality, accessibility, and coverage of capacity building and technical assistance programs on climate finance. And I look forward to working with you all on those efforts. Disclosure is a necessary component of the solution. It defines the problem. Action is required to fix it. That is why GFANS has a multifaceted program that also includes efforts to mobilize more private capital to emerging markets and developing countries in support of a just transition. GFANS supports the development of country platforms and a number of EMDEs across the world, including Senegal and Egypt. These aim to mobilize domestic, international, public, and private finance to enable whole of economy transitions. We are also helping MDBs think through how to better mobilize private investment to EMDEs. We support the World Bank Private Investment Lab, which recently announced a new program to greatly increase the deployment of guarantees for climate-aligned projects. In addition, we believe that voluntary carbon markets can be an important source of capital to help emerging markets and developing economies protect their natural carbon sinks and support their energy transitions. To that end, we are working closely with initiatives like BCMI, ICBCM, and the African Carbon Markets Initiative to improve the quality and scale of carbon markets. GFANS believes it is important that our work is local as well as global and inclusive of all geographies, contexts, and expertise. That is why we established our regional networks. The GFANS Africa Network, chaired by Dr. Mahmoud Mohildin, 
is comprised of leaders and CEOs from African financial institutions, including the AFDV and African Finance Corporation. I would like to thank them for their tireless and impressive work and encourage all of you to get involved in the work of GFANS Africa. With that, I would like to thank you once again for your time and hand back to our chair, Dr. Mahmoud. I see Dr. Rani is itching. Um, so I'm gonna give you a hug and let you go. Okay, so we have a, a second thing. What's the time? So actually what we could do is we could do the signing right now. It's 6.30 because Kevin has a meeting. And then I can have Samila, Anugas, and Simon come up on stage. Dr. Mahmoud, you're going to stay with us. And I've just received a message also from President Adeshina saying that he is going to come by. So he will stop by. So he will still be here, even if Kevin has to leave us. Um, so. Signing ceremony, I don't know how that works. Normally you have a stage or you have a... So we'll just do it here. I'll just sit next to him. Okay, fine. So while we do that, I mean, I'm not... For me, what we're doing with this signing is we're just putting ink to paper, right? It doesn't have to be a big ceremony. We're not making any additional speeches. So what I could do is... And here was my thought. My thought was, success has many mothers and fathers. So as you can see, actually many people want to say many things about the journey that we're on. But now we're at the tough part of it, which is Hasatu, Ugas, you might as well come up, Samaila, and then I'll invite Samson, Simon up last. Um, actually, I have to sign, so I have to sit somewhere. Okay, give me a minute. So, guys, I'm going to ask you, actually, while we're doing the signing, because cameras don't know that anybody's speaking, um, to, you were there when we met with President Ruto, and you're the chair of the Capital Markets Authority, and Kenya has adopted the ISSB standards. And what we heard from GFANS is that we bring, need to bring this to the country level. We need to make it local. And Capital Markets Authority are not, you don't play, you're looking for money. You're looking for investment. So why are you here? Why did you make time to honor this marriage, my husband? Um, and you know, what difference do you think this is going to make? Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, let me, as the only local, I think uh, Kevin is uh, based somewhere else. I'm the only local here. Are you local? <laughs> okay, okay, that helps. So, Karibuni, or welcome to Kenya. Um, first of all, I have to say that. Number two, um, thank you for, being, uh, for giving me this opportunity today to um, talk about the capital markets and uh, ISSP and uh, MDBs, such as the Africa Development Bank um, and others in terms of uh, making sure the adoption of these uh, disclosures and standards and what benefits they bring to, to us in these markets. So basically, I was there at uh, um, you know, COP28. Um, I was there at uh, uh, Sharm el Sheikh for the last uh, event in, uh, uh, for the, uh, this, this summit last year, same time. And now I'm here. Um, I think the main uh, issue for us is, yes, we have already gone in the journey of adopting these standards. We have taken them up. And uh, uh, some of the reasons we took them up is, number one, um, you know, um, we, uh, the capital markets is a member of IOSCO, first of all. 
We are members of IOSCO and uh, we align ourselves accordingly. So this has been adopted and we've gone in the same line. Number two, our investors are demanding it in the securities markets. Um, you know, in our markets now, you know, the, um, we are very much dependent on inflows, which we need very badly in our markets. And therefore, in order to create um, standards that uh, investor friendly, create transparency, um, we've decided to adopt this. The heavy lifting definitely is in how the implementation process is going to look like. We see value in them in terms of sustainability of corporate culture. We see value in making sure that uh, there's, as everybody has said, there's comparable data across regions, across jurisdictions that listed companies beyond even, you know, uh, we're talking about um, the governance side, beyond the environment, the governance side, as well as the social responsibility. Those are very valuable for sustainability of corporates. Um, and therefore, we are looking to, the concept of proportionality, for example, has been uh, alluded to by uh, um, Emmanuel Faber, um, and making sure that we put this according to the way we can be able to implement. So we are putting through the multiple stakeholders from the central banks to the Ministry of Finance to regulators in the insurance sector, regulators in the pension industry, regulators in the accounting, ECPAC, as was mentioned. All those entities are coming together to create the regulations required for implementation of this. So. Thanks very much, Ogas. Okay. It's a very powerful um, endorsement of. Um, I'm sitting next to a challenger. Now, let me just explain to the room that President Adishino is coming, so my husband, Kevin, has to wait um, until we receive him, and then we'll give him a few moments to speak. But in the interim, we're going to have this engagement. You're a big challenger because what you're interested in is capital flows and investments. How do disclosures help you with that? Um, that's, so reflect on that question. Mr. President. No, no, no. I, I got up and sat down here, so you have a seat there. You want to listen? Yeah. Well, I was throwing a challenging question at the African Finance Corporation. How much time do you have? Five. <laughs> Let me change the plan. So what we have just done, Mr. President, is we have just signed. Officially, the ISSB has married you. <laughs> and in fact, GFAN spoke about it. The chair of the ISSB spoke about it as well. And so we were waiting for you to come so we can take a picture to consummate the marriage with you present and show the signatures on paper. We talked about the fact that you met with Emmanuel in New York and you talked about this marriage. <laughs> and we want to thank you for actually making it happen. We want you in the middle. middle. Okay. This is the marriage certificate. <laughs> here, you uh, this, here you see the marriage certificate. Oli, if you have anything against this marriage, say it now or forever hold your mouth.
is working. It is working now. Dr. Additional, we went through different countries. So we started with Egypt. You can stay. I'll, I'll, I'll just stay there. We started with Egypt, and then we went to Kenya. And fortunately, we're now at Nigeria. And actually, in terms of the ISSB standards adoption, the first country that raised its hand was Nigeria. I know you're not Nigerian, you're Africa at large, and so I'm not saying that. But I have just invited onto the stage, and I was about to ask Samila, who is the head CEO of the African Finance Corporation and also represents Nigeria, to ask his challenging questions or make his challenging statements. But in Nigeria, Weddings have a master of ceremony, and there is a lot of pomp. And even yesterday at the banquet, you are the epitome for me of marriage, because you were on the stage, and you sang, and you danced to our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Grace. And so we are going to ask you, please, before you leave, to say a few words to bless this marriage. Podium is yours. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, sorry that I'm late. I've, I just had a probably seven, almost seven hours of uh, discussion with my Board of Governors presentation. So um, I'll just rush back to my hotel and get a, get a breather. And, and then, but I, I knew that if I did that, I would not get certification from the International Sustainability Standards Board. Uh, and so I needed to, 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 to be here. First, let me thank you, Indidi, uh, for your uh, foresight for your leadership and commitment to the issue of working with African countries to improve the issue of their sustainability standards. We are in a period where in, um, it's, we say it's green growth. And when you're talking about green growth, you have to talk about forests, you have to talk about biodiversity, you have to talk about the fact that you have natural capital stock, but the problem that we have in Africa is that we are rich green. I mean, we are, in a way, have a lot of resources that are green. But in fact, we are poor green, uh, which means that the value of our natural capital stock is not taken into consideration in the valuation of the wealth of Africa. And so when this conversation started, I told the CEO of, I mean, the chairman of the uh, ISSB that for us, we don't want to be poor green. We want to be rich, green, because we're talking about energy transition. We talk about energy transition, literally everything you need for that. Is it platinum? Is it cobalt? Is it nickel? Is it, is it lithium? They're all here. So when you talk about an electric vehicle market that will rise to $57 trillion, you know, and, and I know that KKK is going into um, a lot of work on uh, decarbonizing transport system in Nigeria, and you're talking about Nigeria, those resources are in Africa. Second, you take a look at the Congo Basin, for example. The Congo Basin is the second largest lungs you have in the world after the Amazon. But Congo, DRC, Gabon, Central African Republic, with all of these resources that they have, this asset that they have, they are poor. And the valuation of their risk is very, very high. And the way in which you get more resources from the multilateral development bank is a through IMF, it's a very simple ratio. It's a ratio between your debt and your GDP. Debt to GDP ratio. But if you, if you, if you, if you misestimate my GDP, then my debt to GDP ratio will always continue to be high. And when we talk about the issue of green transitions, we're talking about the issue of, of having um, carbon sequestration, that you have in all these forests, all these mangroves, and all this that we have, it's not valued. And the reason why we are where we are today in terms of pollution, and even, uh, uh, Mudin, my, my brother, what we, for all the great work that you're doing uh, with regard to climate change, is because we're using a wrong measure of wealth. And we've been using that since the Industrial Revolution, which is GDP, which is the value of goods and services that an economy produces. But, you're not asking me the question, how is it produced? How about the externalities of that? How are those externalities internalized? And therefore, we use a measure which rewards those that pollute. And it's like chasing your tail. We've got to change that. 
We cannot use a wrong measure hoping to have a right thing. And when you have countries that have natural resources, forests, peatlands, and all these things that are very important for sequestering carbon and keeping us all alive, we have to value the green assets of Africa properly. We have to standardize. So there are lots of issues that have to do with methodologies and how you quantify that and how you standardize all across that I believe that having the International uh, Sustainability Standard Board working with us is very, very fundamental to that. I got together with 11 African heads of state, which now call C11. So myself and President uh, of uh, DRC Congo, I'm not no, sorry, President of Congo, uh, President um, Sasu Ngeso, are co-chairing this thing called C11. So all these countries want to come together and say, how do we use natural resource accounting to make sure that the GDP of Africa takes into consideration its natural capital stock? And when that happens, your debt to re-estimate GDP that is based on a good estimation of your natural capital assets goes down because we are living in a green economy. So that means that the headroom is bigger. And that bigger headroom allows you to be able to have access to more financing to invest more green because that's what we want to have, more green. And so for me, my interest is working with the ISSB to make sure we can help us in that big task that we have taken on, on behalf of Africa as requested by African heads of state. Second thing I want to say why we are working with ISSB has to do within, again, with how we mobilize private financing for climate. Today, in terms of climate finance, only 14% of it is from private sector. And that needs to go up. And we often hear, in fact, we did, my brother there is the one, I'm sure with his colleagues that coined it, from, from billions to trillions. I still have to put my hand in his pocket and find the trillions for me. <laughs> yes. But it got us thinking. It's good analytical work that got us thinking. The point I'm trying to make is that that billions is not with the public sector. I mean, those trillions, I'm sorry, is with the private sector. So if we are going to tr really get those trillions, it means the fastest way to do that is to turn the economies green. And to turn the economies green, which means the financial systems have to turn green. And that's why we have the Africa Financial Alliance for Climate, which I'm sure you must have mentioned to them, which takes all the financial institutions in Africa, central banks, also looks into your stock exchanges, and make sure you can turn them green. Take, for example, a stock exchange. If the valuation of companies on stock exchange were to take into consideration the the greenness of their assets, and you have good carbon pricing within those societies, the valuation of our capital markets in, in a green economy will go up tremendously because we have only 0.26% in Africa of the global green bonds that are coming to this continent. So that changes the game completely. And then people can invest a lot more in green assets. So that's why I think that, again, to do that, what is green? requires methodology, requires standardization. And I think that's where the standards and boards can play a very important role for us. And the last area that I think it's very important for us is just capacity building. So I talked about natural resource accounting and standards that we have to do. How do we support our countries to be able to develop the right methodologies to really measure these green assets that we are talking about? I think the great work that you guys are doing with the ISSB is coming up with the right taxonomies that are necessary, the way in which you standardize things all across. We want to work with you. And so as the priest of this um, uh, wedding that I have just uh, witnessed, um, I want to uh, say that this will be a very blessed wedding. Um, as you know, as a Nigerian, when we go to weddings, we also do something after, which is called Owambe, which is you've got to have a party after. I hope you have a party after this. Uh, event for all these great guys that came to watch you. But in all seriousness, I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank you for your tenacity. I want to thank you for your encouragement. Uh, and, and your CEO, the chairman is, what's his name again? Uh, Emmanuel. I uh, came back to the bank, and he and I talk a lot on the phone. 
I want to thank you, Muirin, for the leadership that you continue to offer for us globally as we think through many of these things. Um, and I just want to say that we are delighted to work with you and uh, in very concrete ways. So uh, may this marriage be blessed and may there be offerings from it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> So um, all the while I was standing here, hope the camera didn't zoom in on me, because I must have shed about, I like the number seven, so I'll say seven tears and not 13, which I, num I also like. And I kept thinking to myself that I went down on one knee with Solomon, and I, I, I put a signature on paper with Kevin. So I mean, what beats that with you? And the only thought that came to mind Okay, so next question, um, Suleiman, um, over to you. Um, but honestly, I, I think that, I think it's grace that brought us here, um, Dr. Adishino. I think it's grace that brought us here. My wife? I, I think, <laughs> yes. She is, in principle. So actually, to honor her, I'm going to go down on two knees. And I do so because I'm so grateful. Because it's not just, it's grace that brought us here. Not just grace, the loyalty and the power of, of the vision and collaboration which you symbolize, but it's also grace that brought us this far. That we talked about something and that we've signed it. But if we've signed it, we have to do it. And so everything that you said on stage as the blessing of this marriage, everyone in this room, because it's not AFTB and ISSB or G fans, it's got to be everyone. And so what I'm asking for actually from this room is, you know, African marriages, it's not two people that get married. It's communities that get married. So this is the community. And it's not about disclosures. It's not about standards. It's about unlocking capital flows. And it's actually about rethinking the economic and financial architecture of the global ecosystem so that Africa, which is the world's carbon sink, can thrive. And not just Africa. Africa is a symbol of the global self. And so that's what I'm on two knees for. Thank you. Should I free you? Okay, so I'm gonna free Kevin now, and I'm gonna invite Simon up, and I'm gonna liberate myself from this microphone and ask my brother, Sulmaila, to start with his very controversial response to how you're gonna act. I think you've, uh, you've kind of set the bar for realism and not controversy. So I will just start by um, thanking you all. I think this was very, very powerful, very moving. And I, I want us to all commit to make this work. Like you said, for us, it's always a village. It's not a, it's not a couple. Um, so I, I would like to start by you know, um, trying to you know, build on the opportunity. Build on the opportunity of how we can move forward. So, you know, um, I think we all know that the future of the world is electric. We all know that. We all know that energy transition is really a profound opportunity for change and growth for all of the world. And by some design of nature, in Africa, we have 40% of the minerals and metals that are required for the energy transition. I'm not going to list them. You know, from the largest platinum reserves, largest cobalt reserves, largest bauxite reserves, 
significant copper reserves, you know, and more importantly, significant renewable energy potential. I say potential because we have 10,000 gigawatts. In fact, the International Energy Association tells us that 60% of the best solar sources globally is in Africa. But just 1%, or about 1%, has been built. We also know that 110 gigawatt potential for wind energy exists in Africa. We also know that 350 gigawatts of hydro potential exists in Africa. And 400 gigawatts exist of, geothe of geothermal gas potential, as well as 15 gigawatts of geothermal capacity here, mostly here in, in Kenya. So the issue is there is no way to net zero. There is no way to pragmatic net zero without Africa. So we all have to understand that. And what that means is that the investments that would have to take us to net zero has to happen in the global south and in Africa in the main. So the question now is, with all this potential and all this aspiration, why are we still not seeing the flows? Why are we still talking about Africa in terms of aid and charity and grants when this is a significantly viable investment proposition? So my love, it's a great question. So what I'm gonna try and do is I'm gonna try and pass the baton and start a conversation for the last, technically we have seven minutes, but if you will allow me, I'll stretch that a little bit. And so that's a great question. And I wanna ask you, Simon, um, to actually wage that question, and then Hasato, I'd like to come to you because you're the chief financial officer of the African Development Bank, and you sit on top of a lot of investments, and in fact, you have been called the evangelist of the SDRs. But let's give you a chance, first of all, Simon. Why do you think this hasn't happened? What are we waiting for? What needs to happen? So it's like a perfect compliment, because I'm not gonna talk about energy, I'm gonna talk about nature. So it works really well, but actually one could almost, if you'll excuse the pun, give a carbon copy um, uh, of the same story. Um, but maybe I could just start with the ISSB, uh, since that is part of what brings us here. So the transmission mechanism that we all want to happen is that initiatives like the ISB deliver more capital flows. And, and the question we have to ask is, is that gonna happen automatically? Yeah, or is that one piece of the story, but only one piece of the story? Um, and I think, when I think of the nature space, you know, uh, and of course nature is now planned to be part of ISSB, as we had always hoped, and now we begin to see progressing. Yeah, we see the data layer, the metrics layer, the natural capital accounting, the ability to translate natural capital accounting into financial accounting, the ability to translate financial accounting into balance sheet entries and asset valuation, that actually we begin to see that, you know, being standardized and we've got, hey presto, a sort of a nature finance operating system. Great, now I'm gonna pass it over to Hasatu. I told you I'm gonna jump, because that's a very important piece of the puzzle. What Simon has just done is he's talked about nature essentially working its way into financial statements. So sustainability now becomes a purview of the chief financial officer. So Hasatu, that's a perfect entry point for you, but how exactly is this going to unlock capital? <laughs> and I'm very glad to be sitting next to you because <laughs> that's for nature swap. I think it's something um, that has become topical and relevant, and I think it's very important because um, that for nature swaps allows countries that do not have the means to do so to be able to invest in green, in sustainability, and um, I don't know, while without having to, um, while benefiting from, from fiscal space. So this is something that we are looking at at the African Development Bank, and it's part of that, I don't know, uh, I would say value chain of, uh, of essential things to be done. So you, you, you said earlier, you talked about, you know, this should not be a one-off, and I don't think that we can turn back the clock on climate. Climate change um, is real, and um, there is, Africa is starting to catch up. The um, conference that happened, that occurred here last year, 
uh, organized by Kenya was really a testimony of the recognition by African countries that there is no climate on one side and development on the other side. It is a recognition that the two, the two are linked and that actually climate change exacerbates the development challenges that we have. So that is a very, very important step. And this year, for the first time, I'm hearing some of our governors say, we want to um, invest. It used to be you know, a mantra from the non-Africans, but right now you're seeing much more Africans saying, I want you know, sustainable, sustainable infrastructure, I want climate-related investment, and so forth. So there is that recognition. And the next steps is how do you make it, how do you accelerate that? And this initiative is exactly about this. It is about how do you make the financial, um, the financial system, the financial regulations help nudge, uh, nudge this. The president talked about the uh, AFAC, and I think that the AFAC is exactly about that. It's about bringing awareness. It's about um, you know, data. It's about uh, standardization. But also the work that is being done at ISSP is extremely important. And for the African Development Bank, so I'm, I'm coming with my CFO uh, hat and with my uh, you know, controller sitting out there and uh, my uh, auditor sitting next to her. Uh, we are reporting under IFRS and it is about compliance. So we have to report on the ISSB. It's about compliance, it's about best practices. And another thing that I want to say, I mean, the climate discussion has accelerated in recent years. The risks are, are real. And my, my fear is that you know, it's going just so fast that if we do not catch up in terms of financial systems, regulations, et cetera, we may, be, you know, we may find ourselves shut off the market. It's very powerful. And Hasato, I know you need to leave at 7. So the reason why I've given you this is because I'm not going to come back to you but rather we'll let you slip out. I'm very glad that you've said that your head of audit and also your financial controller are in the room because we're going to need them to get involved. Where I want to challenge that thought, though, is that this is not just about compliance. Um, this is also about identifying risks and opportunities and making sure, Absolutely. and this is the reason why your leadership is so important, because so far it has been about compliance, like you've rightly said, and so now we need to make that transition beyond compliance, and Somalia, you've called it value creation. And not just value creation, also unlocking the value that already exists on the African continent and making that happen. And I know that you're taking a big step in that regard. You want to say something else before I hand back to Simon? Yes. So I said it's about compliance because right now we have to report on it the way that it, we are required to report on it. So it's about financial compliance, it's about compliance. But awareness with regards to climate risk has, you know, has been there at the African Development Bank for a very long time. So if, even if you look at the, uh, the strategy of the bank, the, um, the mission and objectives of the instit institution, it's about climate. It was about how do we help Africa transition to green growth because there was a clear awareness internally that that needed to happen. And you know, among the steps that we've taken, and I'm sure that Kevin you know, spoke at length about those things, but you know, all our operations have to be climate screened. And our um, uh, objective, our aspiration is that, that, that next year, 100% of all our projects will be you know, uh, climate proof. So there is that, that, uh, that recognition of internally that this is important, but now we have to report on it, so it's about compliance. Okay, so, so Hasato and I are going to continue debating that because um, I find that when, and, and Simon, um, Ogas, and Samaila, I'm going to ask you to comment on that because I think that's a good way to close and then I'll ask Dr. Moyo Dean to conclude on that. So my, my experience... If I, may, if I may, you know, because we are talking about SDR and I yes. really need to recognize Dr. Mahmoud, Mahmoud Moyo Dean. Yes, you may. He's been extraordinary. He's been extremely supportive. And one of the reasons why the IMF you know, uh, agreed to um, or authorized the use of hybrid capital for SDR channeling, I mean, most of it was his fault. So I Absolutely. really want to recognize him and thank him for the support. It's also the reason why he's closing and putting the cherry on the cake in terms of helping us get to action. Because you know, if we're not able to unlock 
those MDBs and those significant funds, just like you've said, Hasatu, and thank you for evangelizing on this, then where are we going? But it's a first step. And the reason why I want to raise this question about compliance versus value creation is what I've found in the market is that people are petrified of this just being compliance because of the burden and cost of reporting. And so what we've been emphasizing, and the reason why proportionality, the reason why Emmanuel spoke about proportionality is because the ISSB standards meet you where you are. Because it's not just about the big companies, it's also about the value chain, the supply chain, and the smaller entities. And it's about creating value and identifying risks. And in fact, and Sumaila, maybe I'll start with you and then go to Simon, it's about de-risking so that the cost of capital is reduced and so that we're unlocking capital flows to create value on the continent. But what are your thoughts on that? Compliance versus value creation, and how do we find the balance? I think it's both, always. Um, but for, from our perspectives, we're looking at it more from unlocking value, value capture, uh, value creation. That's really how we're looking at it. And we have seen several projects that we have. So for example, we have the first carbon neutral industrial park in Africa, in Gabon. We have um, the first climate resilient adaptation fund being supported by the Green Climate Fund. We have built the largest renewable energy asset with solar wind assets in Egypt, Senegal, South Africa, Djibouti, um, and Cape Verde on, on, on the continent. And we have several um, such initiatives were collaborating with the AFDB on the battery minerals value chain study to unlock the copper belt. We're leading on the Lobito 2 corridor together with the AFDB as well to um, unlock you know, the supply chain or diversify supply chain for critical minerals. So we're working on several of these initiatives. And what we've found is that what has helped us is the fact that we have placed specific focus on sustainability and sustainability reporting. So when we engage with our investors, they're able to see how we are impacting the communities that we work with and how the communities also impact our operations, which I think is the core of sustainability uh, reporting. So it, it works for us in a way that it allows us you know, to better communicate what we're doing. I mean, we're going to learn more about this standard now. We already work with IFRS um, standards. We've done that for the since it became, uh, I can't remember, I mean, we've always done IFRS. So now that this is part of it, we're also going to key in. Again, for us, is how can we capture and retain more value on the continent? How can we demonstrate that Africa is indeed an investment destination? And we do that all the time. So for example, one of the things that I'm really excited about is a project that we're working on with uh, our partners in the UK. And the idea is to develop Smiler. a large Not solar wind battery plant that will provide 8% of the energy requirements of the UK. Thank you. And I think we need to have a longer panel, um, Hasato, next year so that we can actually get to the meat of this discussion. I feel bad cutting everyone off, but I'm trying to get to the point where you can actually hear Dr. Mahmoud do the closing, so I'm, I'm holding you. Simon, Definitely. one of the things you said to me, Simon, was nature and technology. That was a very powerful statement. I want to make sure you mention it. I will mention it. Um, I know that if I don't, you will punish me. Um, so definitely, definitely. So, so firstly, it, it, it's, it's not just compliance and it's not just risk. You know, the integration of climate risk into sovereign debt markets has only hurt climate vulnerable countries almost all in Africa. Yeah, it hasn't heard Switzerland or Goldman Sachs last time I checked. And so the reason we have debt for nature swaps and other important financial innovations is because we need to build upside into financial markets, not only into the real economy. So that's an important piece to understand. We mustn't repeat that error with nature. Now on the nature side, your president was absolutely right, which is we need to price the lungs of the planet. If, if one sort of takes literally what he said, we need to value ecosystem services that have public goods right. But Africa's development can't depend on priced ecosystem services. I don't believe that. Yeah, it has to depend on the nexus between biodiversity, 
and technology. What does that mean? Well, it's the bioeconomy, bioplastics, biopharma, biochemicals, bioengineering. Actually, the major new sectors are not only in the energy space, although they're also in the energy space, you know, we're going to see a bioeconomy already $4 trillion last year, estimated to rise to $30 trillion in the next 20 years, you know, go is going to be a major part of the global economy. Is Africa going to be supplying commodities into that bioeconomy, or is it going to be capturing the value chain that has the technology uplift to go with it? And that seems to me is exactly where the AFDB and others need to play an important role not only at the project level, but really at the strategic level in driving nature into those technology spaces and sectors going forward. Thank you so much, Simon. You even ended yourself. I'm impressed. Um, I want to ask you a tough question, Ugas. I'm sorry. I promised that I wouldn't. But let me ask you a tough question. So a lot of the time, the ISSB is criticized because they are said, you know, why are you focusing only on investors? on the one hand, why is that your primary focus? And secondly, you know, how exactly does this help Africa? And so a lot of the time when people see, well, 22 African countries are on the path to adoption. Yesterday I got a call from another, so 23. They're like, why is Africa doing this? And Kenya, well, after Nigeria, is also leading on this initiative. So why, why? <coughs> thank you. Uh, let me thank you first for kneeling down for action. I think that was very significant. I, I just felt there was something very serious about that. And uh, I think the, if I was to go one step up, I, the issue of commitments needs to go to the issue of implementation of commitments on what we hear. You know, I'm in the bottom of the food chain in this whole conversation right now because I'm local. This is where I am in the capital markets. This is where investments are required. Once you leave all this, inclusion, including the supranational and, and, uh, and uh, this, you know, MDBs, and you come to the ground. We're in the ground. And what we need here, and I'll answer your question, but uh, what we need here is really we need to go beyond all that and ask ourselves, how do we implement this new standards that we've committed to adoption, and what do we need? Actually, what we need is capacity building. Let's begin with that. We need some serious capacity building. This is not a one-size-fit-all scenario. We have a situation, as I think the president said, we have a situation where valuation is a problem. We have, and that has to be fixed through the standards. The standards have to reflect what is the valuation of what the assets we have in our ecosystems and in our nature-based systems and, you know, so that we get the right valuations for that, so that other, our equation bottom denominator, we say denominator, uh, uh, numerator denominator, can yield to a ratio that is correct, that is at the end of the day significant for us. So I think the bottom line is we're looking for investments, we're looking for the commitments to start coming, we're looking for if yesterday the reason you did not want to invest in Africa is because you did not have information and data, this becomes the springboard. Now the data will be available. Once the data becomes available, you have no other reason but to come and, because and this is the emerging markets and the frontier markets that everybody, and of course we've talked about how much wealth Africa has that has been untapped. So there's so much potential, yes, but we are not able to show it to the world, showcase it. This is the opportunity to use these standards, to disclose this uh, data, and be able to stay in a level playing field so that, you know, when you talk about credit ratings and these things, we have something we can put forward that becomes the reason why this becomes an attractive market. So we're looking for investments, we're looking for capacity building, we are looking for uh, uh, you know, uh, being able to be compared with those other markets uh, through data disclosures. And uh, I, I, I think, in my view, um, it's also good for business, even internally, local investment too, the whole thing. You know, we're looking for environmental sustainability. If the rest have burned the world, we don't want to burn the world too. We want to sustain it. That's also our moral duty at the same time, of course, being business, being uh, one of those things. So. 
I, 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 thank, I want to thank you so much. I think uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud is going to be closing, but let me just say thank you very much. Um, the capital markets in Kenya, the securities exchange, the company, you know, the companies that are in those. Uh, you asked something about compliance versus, you know, um, what was the other one? Value creation. Value creation. No one can force anybody to do anything. Uh, I, we don't want to do that, actually. This is about flexibility. It's about feedback mechanisms. It's about being able to reach a consensus on what needs to be done. At some point, maybe there might be compliance and maybe mandatory compliance. But for now, we want people to come on board because there's value in this thing. And we want to show them the value. So what we need is we need everybody to come on board and help in the capacity building of the local institutions, of our exchange, and everybody else, you know, so that we can all be on the same level. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ogas. Um, I'm, I'm going to do... Yes, go ahead. So just don't get me wrong. It's not compliance versus unlocking. It is the whole chain, right? Mm -hmm. So at one point, in, some, in, the, in the developed world, I mean, in the, in the more advanced countries, it is about compliance. You have to comply. In Africa, you don't have to comply yet. You know, it's you voluntary. You have to comply if you want capital. What? Well, it, yeah, it just depends. So, so, so basically what I'm saying is that it is the whole chain. So I have to comply as a CFO of the African Development Bank. Kevin has to unlock. And I do help him unlock sometimes. <laughs> I, I really like, I really, really like that. And, and just to, so I wanted to say something to, to when Ugas says it's, you, you don't have to. I'll tell a little story. I want to also ask Davina, Evie, Tony, my man, um, who anchors a lot of this, David, Tim, all the team members that have helped bring this together. I actually want you to come on stage and actually let's capture this, let's take a photo, let the room know the work that you did. It's very important to me that we do that and possibly we'll take the photo and then Dr. Mahmoud will close. But I just wanted to say something brief about Ugas. So when we came to Kenya for a meeting, we had a long day of meetings, and our closing meeting was with President Ruto. And then, you know, we got a message saying, sorry, President Ruto cannot see you today because he's somewhere else. He will see you tomorrow morning, first thing in the morning. And so Ugas, who's right now saying it's not about compliance, about value creation, worked with us to reach out to the president and president flew in on his helicopter because we were flying out the next morning and came in to have that meeting with us. And as we sat around this little round table discussing very important things, including nature capital and what we were going to do with the ISSB standards in Kenya, the first thing he did was he looked at Ugas and he was like, I gave you a meeting for 8 a.m. tomorrow, but it was not good enough. We had to have the meeting today. And we smiled, had a great joke, laughed, had an incredible meeting. But what I want to say is when Ugas says, this is about creating value and making sure everyone is on board, it doesn't mean we don't actually get it done within the time frame that we need to get it done in order to create value and to deliver. So it's really, Hasatu, I want to agree with you that it's both, but it, it can't be one without the other. And I like the way you ended in that conversation. So Dr. Mahmoud, if you will allow me to invite you to the stage, but also invite our champions in the room to take a quick photo Photographer, if we can do three seconds and just take a photo, and if we can just applaud the team that actually helped to make this happen. But we need to be very quick. Tony, David, Tim, Hasatu, uh, please stay. Davina, Evie, have I forgotten anyone? Please come. And the auditor and the controller general, please join, because the work is going to land on your shoulders afterwards.
Right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful, inspiring, substantive um, uh, discussion. And this definitely the best uh, closing um, we had with this uh, uh, panel. I had, of course, uh, the honor of uh, getting the president of the African Development Bank with us and all of the speakers. And I, I, I really like just to say a couple of things. Um, that the team in the preparation of these closing remarks uh, uh, prepared me well, and um, despite the fact that indeed he did a great job in, um, in making this uh, session and the previous ones very uh, dynamic, but still the next steps are solid. I, start, I was just marking them if they're still valid or not after all of these uh, interventions. And um, the first one in the next steps, and I'm happy that there is a great sense of accumulation and continuity and implicit accountability on the discussions that we have been having for almost two years. People have been referring to meetings and events in, um, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, in Dubai, and even in previous years. So the specialized working groups have already been formed around the key themes such as regulatory reforms, climate risk disclosure, capacity building and mobilization of green capital, and they will continue, and it's great to listen to Mary Shapiro um, um, adding the second point to the working groups, which is basically about the capacity building uh, initiatives and the partnerships around the, uh, the um, uh, capacity building and the technical assistance required for that. The third um, next step is the partnership and collaboration, and I've seen a variety of them, and while we have been witnesses, observers uh, on, the, uh, on the marriage, but uh, indeed um, uh, there is another big marriage that happened between the ISSB and the IOSCO, and many of us followed the good news of nearly more than 50% of global GDP, global uh, GHG emissions, and approximately 40% of global market capital uh, capitalization are committed to this kind of uh, collaboration and adherence to the rules of engagement with the ISSB coming from IOSCO. This is of great relevance to all of the capital market uh, regulators, and I'm very happy to see the chief of the Capital Market Authority of Kenya uh, with us with his inspiring um, uh, comments. So what else? Um, coming from the GFANS with the uh, three areas of work that have been emphasized in different work, and the issue about the implementation, and it's not just about impressing the global system, but basically about what we are trying to do to the benefit of the ordinary people. And um, I'm, I'm, uh, for many good reasons, I'm in touch on a daily basis with my village back home in Egypt. And I kept saying what's good for Kafr Shokr, this is the name of my village in Egypt, it's good for Egypt, but I would say what's good for Africa is good for the rest of the world. And, and for that to happen, we need to unleash all the um, capacity that we can really be doing at the regional level, not to wait for blessings. And there is a great deal of difference from one of the very first meetings I had here in this great country, Kenya, when we were hosted for what's called HIPIC initiative, in 1998, almost 25 years, when heads of state, not just heads of state and ministers, were in the room asking leaders from the global north for solutions, saying that we have problems, we need you to help us. We have this issue, we have that issue, we are lacking that. The beauty of this discussion from the very beginning, that there had been a great deal of identification of what we really need to have, we spent like 15 to 20 percent of our time to discuss the problems and provide diagnosis. But every speaker, without exception, spent more time providing solutions and the partnership. So I like what we had been seeing in the past, especially from my former employer, the World Bank, and others. You, you ask for a report, you get 80 percent, 90 percent diagnosis, and perhaps 10 percent some sort of generic recommendations. Here we are seeing something completely different. And, and this is the way that we need really to handle all of the issues of concern when it comes to finance, technology, standards, matters related to implementation, and this is what we got, we got here. And I think the four um, speakers in the last panel had really 
shared with us what the, they managed to offer and the great work of the uh, CFO and her excellent um, uh, proposal uh, almost two years ago, uh, Sato, when you came to the IMF and we were in doubt that this could be working. We, we now have the blessing of the institution, now the heavy lifting of getting the money flowing to the MDBs to, um, uh, to get that done. Many thanks to your efforts, dedication, and you mobilized the rest of the MDBs, including the uh, Inter-American Development Bank that they did a good job. So for you, you brought solution, not just the problem. And what I saw as well from the uh, chief of the Capital Market Authority, that many solutions are there with emphasis on domestic resource mobilization, and I appreciate that. Simon always comes with this issue of emphasis and the uh, capacity to integrate seemingly remote areas of work, but he managed as always to bring finance to technology to nature in a very eloquent way. And of course, what uh, my good brother uh, Samaila, he's identifying issues, but basically on the practice. But why I think the bigger answer to what he outlined of issues is basically what this continent deserves to have of more capital flows and leverage the good um, uh, increase that we require for the African Development Bank and definitely more finances required for the AFC. And it's good that the president of the African Development Bank didn't miss a chance by emphasizing the importance. We're doing what we can in the efficiency side. We're doing what we can in being more relevant, more fit for purpose, but without paid in capital of substance and of magnitude, we are not going to be doing what we can do, but this is basically the shareholders' call, and uh, we need to keep that doing, uh, going by, by making more emphasis on this, and this could happen despite the political constraints, this, the issue of the political leadership there. Having said that, I'm very grateful to the opportunity. I'm very grateful to Ndidi for her uh, uh, not just dynamic moderation of the sessions, but her work behind the work. And I know that many of us will be getting calls from her. You promised this. You asked for that. I'm ready for this. And this is basically thanks to her and her team and uh, the exceptional leadership uh, by Mr. Faber and the rest of the teams who are happy to do business more with you. Thank you all. I know we went beyond time. Uh, but I think for all of a good cause, and this is a great country. If you miss your flight, you can always stay um, uh, more time with us. Thank you so much.